good morning all the participants um this is the second lecture of this uh, school and in the morning lecture you heard a lot of uh, introductory parts of the astronomy particularly the observation related so makes sense for my talk to follow it i will go somewhat more technical in today's talk and the second one will be tomorrow so in these two talks essentially i will be so this is the list of things i will i will of course there will be some repetition obviously because i have to go more technical now so the telescopes uh were discussed in the first lecture but i will go a little more detail i will talk about stellar magnitudes black body radiation which all of you are familiar at least even at the bsc level it is taught then talk somewhat about the instruments the imaging instruments and like ccd and the photometer and somewhere here i will stop probably today's lecture and then tomorrow continue with the spectroscopy and at the end of my lecture tomorrow you will see the slide with all the references and i have not really shared the pdf to uh, the organizer but whoever is interested uh, after my tomorrow stop can write to the organizer and i can then share it but because otherwise i just don't want to share to rest of the people okay so now the first thing is uh, the telescope in itself is actually a uh, a device which basically takes the distant images and gets you closer but of course that is a school level talk santosh is the screen seen because if i do full screen i have i get other things cut out so ha ah, adobe screen is okay because the the part is seen isn't it so ha ah, so that's why i will continue like this because the full screen uh, cuts out other things so this is fine because my font is much bigger so there won't be any problem okay so uh, as i said the telescopes are of two types one is refractor and one is reflector of course very old telescopes from newtonian time were all refractors based on lenses and only in last 100 years or so the reflector telescopes have come that is with mirrors so we will see little more details what are the advantages etc uh, essentially the refractor uses a glass lens as the object some of you must have made at least we made in our school times uh, binoculars using two lenses purchased from the market of course the quality was not good we'll see we used to have color effects on that but that was the easiest thing we did even at school projects so the bigger lens is called the objective and the smaller one is in the ip so i will see. so the top is a reflect refracting telescope this is the objective lens the size defines how much light you can collect from infinity and you will see the light from infinity comes as parallel rays gets focused here and again diverges where you use your eyepiece whereas the reflecting telescope has uh, the same thing except that now this is the primary optics which is the primary mirror and it focuses on a secondary mirror and then uh throws the light out where you put your eye piece so the same eye piece here and here so this is again just the same thing except that the detector is kept here which could be human eye uh, which was of course the first detector all these 100 years back but then other things came up photographic films which many of the younger people in the audience may not know but uh, soon they were uh changed to photomultiplier tubes even that has become more or less out of fashion only the recent thing is the photometer which uses a photodiode a solid state device we will see and also ccd detectors ah, sorry so this is again the same picture objective lens and also i will just uh, skip this now just to tell you that one of the still working oldest telescopes using refractor is the lick observatory and you can see the person standing here you can see the big size and the primary lens is here and the the ipc is here of course where the person can see and it's a massive thing the only good thing is this is a fully closed enclosure so there won't be any dust entering and and other advantages 
So what are the advantages? As I said, initial, once you align, uh, you don't have to do much of, it doesn't go misaligned. Uh, inside the tube, everything is sealed. So you don't need any cleaning from inside. And the air currents, etc., inside the dome don't affect it. Whereas that is a negative point when you talk of open type uh, reflector telescopes. Uh, I was mentioning about binocular. So this effect everyone must have experienced when you were in school, when you made your binocular. So you see the light has different wavelengths and it gets focused at different points on the principal axis. And that's why you see these color rings, which is called chromatic aberration. Now, some ways of reducing this is either using one more compensating lens. So typically the, the primary lens is a planar convex, which takes care of this color aberration to a great extent. Now, there are other issues with the glass because the light has to pass through the lens. So ultraviolet light doesn't pass through glass. In fact, uh, even a thin glass, which is few mm, will stop ultraviolet. And the other major problem is to make, because see, you have to collect light. So the, the primary mirror has to be very large, which means to manufacture such a mirror without any air bubbles is a big challenge. So beyond some point, this whole idea of lenses for uh, refracting telescopes was not really uh, appreciated. And soon people realized that mirrors is the way. Just to remind you that 2008 was year of astronomy and also 400 years of Galileo using a small telescope, which was only four inch to see the moons of uh, Jupiter. But really the glasses were used for spectacles even before that. It's just that he used it as a telescope to see the four moons of Jupiter. Okay, so uh, the other problem is of course the, 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 the lens as it has to become very large, it becomes very heavy. So you have to balance it on the other side. So these are kind of limitations which uh, didn't allow this to go on 100 years back. And soon people realized that there has to be a concave mirror. And this is what is called as a reflected telescope. So the mirror is a parabolic shape. Parallel rays get focused at singular point. They don't have any problem of chromatic aberration because the primary reflection is taking place on the primary mirror. So there is no light really passing through the large lens. Also, the big mirror, bigger the mirror, more light uh, is at the one end so that it can be very made very big. And we'll see some of the large telescopes actually, the mirror size can be, in fact, today's mirrors are not even a single mirror, there are multiple mirrors. Uh, the largest telescope people are talking today are 30 meter. So obviously you can't make a mirror of 30 meter diameter. But there are multiple mirrors which are combined in a honeycomb style. They are much cheaper because you have to only polish one side of the glass and give it a shape. And since it is passing through one surface at the reflection, so the only one side has to be perfectly polished. But the disadvantages are it can easily get the optics out of alignment. The tube is open to outside, so frequent cleaning is required. And the secondary mirror, which used to turn the light towards your eyepiece, uh, has uh, diffraction effects and things like that. This is a typical binocular fashion thing where the light gets uh, inverted. So which means if you are using this kind of telescope called Gregorian, then terrestrial objects will not look reversed. But that doesn't matter for astronomy because star, even if it's a point source, it's always looking as a point source, even if the image is reversed. So, and that's true for any galaxy or anything. So I will not go into too much detail, but the, this mirror, the secondary mirror is supported by what is called as a spider. In this case, you can see a, a three bars coming like this. So you will say that, okay, that is obstructing the light to the prime mirror, but the percentage of obstruction compared to the size of the mirror is very, very small. So 
this is again the same picture essentially on the side you can put a camera here and if it becomes too big or this mirror has to collect a lot of light then of course you will balance the telescope but the light can be taken by a fiber optics to the next room where you can use a big spectrometer which we will see in tomorrow's lecture just skip that skip that uh, this is just a slide to remind most of the students that how statistics is so important in observational astronomy, particularly because you are taking data. So you don't have to go through this in detail. You can get all this information from typical uh, statistics books like Sean series, etc. What is shown here is the mean. So suppose you have an audience now, right now, let's see what is the audience. It's almost... I don't know, more, more than 300 plus. So if you just see the height of all the people in the audience and take a mean of that, where n is this number of more than 300, you will get a mean. And each of this person from the audience will be deviating from this number, which is xi minus x bar. And the mean deviation is just the summation of that. And then this is the variance. So these are the standard statistical quantities for any data. And what is called a standard deviation comes out from this work. All this can be very nicely programmed in any language, C or Python or whatever. What is more important for observation is this last three things. When the scatter data, I will show in the next slide, what it means is within plus minus one sigma, sigma is standard deviation, then it is 68% of those values lie within that. And of course, plus minus three sigma means most of the data is lying 99% within that. Now, what I mean by that is this nice plot, which I've made. This is a scattered data of something. At the moment, I don't have to bother. About 200 data points are there. Now, this you can see two, two of these or these three are outliers. But these in colors I have shown, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma. So the outermost line covers most of the 99% of the data, except these three which are outside. So this is most typically used in any data presentation when you do astronomy. For that matter, of course, not only astronomy, any experiment. Okay, now this is what was mentioned by Shomok in the morning, but now I will give a little more uh, what you call detailed uh, thing. How do you define the magnitudes? Remember, astronomy is one of the very old uh, subject. Somebody is asking, so I, I'll just take this question in the chat box. What the person is asking is about the previous slide, uh, x. So x is basically the, x bar is the mean, as I explained, which is given in the this summation. This is a simple mathematical operation, so uh, you should be able to do it very simply. So I'm coming back to the talk. Now this scale, firstly, it is all in log scale. Why log scale? Because human eye behaves as a sensor in log scale. Everybody knows what is decibel. So our hearing is log scale, decibels are logs. Similarly, human eye also. Which means that as a nature, the person from beginning when, when a person tries to see stars, he is seeing, he or she is seeing in a log scale. So what I am shown here is minus 25. Very bright negative number means it is bright and positive will be very faint. So right from minus 25 to plus 25, this is the faintest, even today with bigger telescopes, you can, see. you can go beyond, but you have to take many pictures and add them. So the human eyes, normally human eye, I have a specs, but people having normal eye in the night can go up to plus six magnitude. So this is the, the Vega is uh, zero magnitude, Sirius, the brightest star is here and some of the planets. And of course, sun is minus 27, is way beyond this scale will go out of the screen. And why it is so bright, we will soon see, because we are still talking of apparent. We have not really talked about the actual magnitude. Okay. So let's move on. Um, this is a table which shows that if two stars of the same magnitude, the same brightness, and their light coming out, let's say it varies by a factor of 100. So if the magnitude difference is zero, it is one. And if it is five, it is hundred. 
This can be represented by this simple log formula. This is where the log effect comes for the human eyes thing. You can reverse this F2 by F1 into this. Okay. Um, so this is still we are at apparent magnitude. We have not really talked about the absolute magnet, uh, magnitude. Okay, there are some trivial questions. I will not answer them. Somebody is asking about why ultraviolet can't pass through glass because uh, the glass has a refractive index is the function of refractive index and light, which doesn't allow it to pass. Okay, I'll, I will probably come back to the chat box at the end of the talk, otherwise it uh, obstructs the flow. Now, as I said, Sun is minus 26. Sirius is minus 1.4. This is the brightest star. Sun is also a star, but really Sun is, is very bright. And M stands for apparent magnitude. V stands for, since we are using visible light. The human eye is used as the first detector. It's called V, but there are other colors which we will come to. So this is a typical answer if a school kid asks that given a telescope of size D, what is the brightest star I can see. So remember, the most common question the public or the school kids can ask during science days and all uh, is how far I can see. But technically, that's a wrong question. Why? How far is wrong? Because telescope, so the astronomy itself is so relative that what you're talking, what talk, Shomak talked in the morning, there are distances, parsecs and megaparsecs, etc. So distance is extremely relative. All you can say is how bright or how faint you can observe from Earth, or for that matter, from Moon or anywhere. So this is a simple formula, very approximate, which you can put in the diameter and you can get the limit. So for human eye, which has a dark adapted pupil size of about uh, 4 or 5 mm, then you can see up to 6.5. So when in a totally dark place in the night with no city lights, you, if you have a normal eye, you can see up to 6.5. Magnitude. You remember the the scale which I showed. Six point five is there. If you use a six inch telescope or an eighteen inch, it doesn't matter whether it's a reflector or refractor. See, it is not doubling up so easily. It's a log scale. So even with eighteen inch, you can go only up to fifteenth magnitude. So now slowly we have to introduce the distance, which was only mentioned in the morning talk. We will quantify it further. So Earth motion around Sun, six months apart, January and July, it doesn't matter. It could be any six months apart. You are trying to take this angle of a star, which is close to you compared to a background of very distant stars. Because as I said, everything is relative. With this method itself, it's called the parallax method. You have to measure this angle. And of course, the smallest angle possible by this method is only uh, one hundredth of an arc second. Just to quickly tell you what is an arc second. It's uh, one degree, 60 arc minutes, and one arc minute has 60. So one degree has 3600 arc seconds. It's a very small angle, but significant right now in astronomy. So this is the way you would measure this angle. And if this angle is one arc second, then that distance, which means if this angle is one arc second, this distance whether it is distant to sun or earth doesn't matter because these are very lo long distances. It will be one parsec. So half that angle will be two parsecs. Okay. As was mentioned, most of the stars which you see in the night are less than that. So they are anyway more than one parsec. They are quite far. In fact, how far and how close we will see in the next two slides. Now this accuracy, as I said, by this method, is up to 100 parsecs, which transforms to 0 0.01 arc second kind of thing. Because be below that angle, it's very difficult to measure. There are other methods called spectroscopy, you know, which I will not tell uh, in this talk. But yes, the simplest trigonometric parallax method allows you to go up to 100 parsecs. Now, the nearest star, which is alpha century, is 4.3 light years, which is 1.3 parsec. And this angle already you see is less than 0.1 arc second uh, and 1 arc second. So 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 arc second. This is just a quick conversion. 10 parsec is 0 0.1 arc second. 1 parsec is 3.26 light here. And 1 light year is almost 10 to the power 13 kilometers. 
the ideal was clearly explained in the morning the light from sun even though it is not a light year away it takes 8 minutes so now we will now get into the actual absolute measurement but before that i just want to show you this slide if you see in the night this is what you see the brighter star cirrus and other things usually this view will be seen in the uh, overhead around 8 9 o'clock in the night in january february but actually if you put these stars in their real distances then this is what you will see cirrus is actually very faint star other stars although they look faint here they are actually closer and they will look much brighter so this diameter of this white is the brightness why this is happening is because of this many stars appear brighter than nearby ones okay because their magnitude was still apparent but now we'll talk of absolute magnitude so how the astronomers defined in early days they said let's assume a 10 parsec now a 10 parsec is as if a shell a balloon from us which is 10 parsec away and for a moment think that all those stars which you see in the night hypothetically just sit at the surface of the balloon which means now they have all come to 10 parsec which means a star which was actually 40 parsec away has been brought to 10 parsec at the uh, sphere the hypothetical sphere which is the surface of the balloon which means it has come four times closer when i say four times closer one by r square law it becomes 16 times brighter and 16 times brighter from the magnitude scale makes it three magnitudes bright. Which means the star which had a small mv, apparent magnitude of plus nine, at this hypothetical circle or sphere is actually plus six. So which means now I can call this star as a capital M stands for absolute magnitude. V again is still the visible band becomes plus six. Now with this scaling and this concept, Let's see how the stars go. So sun, which is so bright because you are so close to sun, it is minus 26, small mv. But the plus m, 4.9, this sun is actually a faint star, which means sun is close to us. If I move it back to the balloon surface, it will become a faint star. Cirrus basically changes the sign, but it's also a faint star. This star, region, bright blue star, very close in the Orion Nebula, is actually a very bright star. Similarly, Betelgeuse, the red giant, is also a bright star. And interestingly, Vega is just sitting at the surface of the balloon, which is 10 parsec. And that's why most of the people observe Vega whenever it is available to calibrate their instruments. Because if I, with Vega, suppose I'm getting 23 counts and somebody in other part of the world gets 46 counts, then I know it's a factor of two. Because this is what is called as a standard star. These are again some conversion from the, what is this distance business coming as called distance modulus. So capital M minus small m makes this, where pi is the parallax angle or reverse it, then here is the distance. This is small d, not the diameter of the telescope, the distance in parsec. These formulas can be used. So which means if you have measured these two, you can find the distance to the star. Um, there is another interesting thing. Uh, this was defined by somebody called Lord Rayleigh, who was a uh, Britisher, but he was also an astronomer. He uh, tried to define these things. For example, if you have a telescope of diameter, let's say one meter, and you put these numbers, then you will get how you can resolve two stars. So suppose there are two stars in the sky. This is what the two stars in the sky, and each star Interestingly, if suppose only one star is there, this one is blocked, then you will get this pattern of the light. And if you block the other one, then you will get the dash pattern. Why these wiggles are there? Because these are what is called as the airy pattern. I'm not again going into too much detail, but airy pattern essentially comes as if there is no atmosphere in the on the earth, and you are trying to see a star as if from the which doesn't have a star. So he defined this, and this number is basically number uh, which is coming. Uh, see, before I even define this number, everybody uses a scientific calculator. When you do sine theta, sine of an angle, say 30 degrees, 
you have to always go to the option of degree. Otherwise, in the calculator, scientifically, you have a radian. So essentially, sign of any angle is the opposite side by the hypotenuse, right? This is the basic trigonometry, and it's a ratio. So ratio is a number, and which means theta has to be in radian. Only way to convert is to use uh, degree to radian. So what happens in 360 degrees? You have two pi radians. So you have a full circle of 360 degrees, which means two pi radians, right? Two pi radians means what is the radian then? It comes out to be 57 point some degrees, okay, and that comes out to be this many arc seconds, one radian. So that's how this number has come, because we want the answer in arc seconds. So that's why I have to put this number. This is just a quick uh, table here. Anybody having a very good vision, absolute sharp is one arc minute. Remember, this is not arc second. Is much bigger one arc second, one arc minute. Clear vision and comfortable vision, four arc minute. This I already told you. Essentially, the cross point defines the two stars, and assuming that the stars are the same brightness, this should be eighty percent of this peak. Then you can technically define that two stars are separately seen. But sometimes it may happen that this is a fainter star, and also this is closer. Then you will see just a bump here, even though it is not. Strictly by Rayleigh criterion, but you can still distinguish them. I'll just skip this. This is the same thing. So this is about the airy pattern, which you nicely see. Uh, if it is a perfect star with no twinkling, I'm coming to twinkling very soon. Steady sky, you will see the rings. These are those uh, the plots which I showed. Now this is another very important aspect. We talked about binocular, which is typically two inch, which is 50 mm. Four inch is 100 mm diameter, okay? What is happening using that formula? The R is continuously reducing. The amount of resolution between the two objects in the sky using these telescopes is this number, R, okay? Obviously a half a meter, 500 millimeter is just one tenth of this, okay? But why I have drawn a line here, this is where the atmosphere stops. So even though you are using a very big telescope, okay, there is nobody to stop the size of the telescope. I even talked about very large size, 30 meter. This number will become smaller and smaller, but this line stops. What is this line is the atmosphere effect. Everybody in nursery have learned uh, twinkling of star. So essentially the star doesn't look like a dot unless you are using a small telescope. So there is more details to it. Right now, I'm just giving you an overall picture, which means bigger the telescope than four inch, you will see the star always as a fuzzy dot. And it's continuously dancing within about an arc to two, two arc second blob. So this is the reason why bigger telescopes have problem. That most doesn't allow. Of course, you can have a telescope on moon. You will be able to resolve these things. But then launching a big telescope on moon itself, coming out of gravity, is a big challenge. So let's continue on this line. So what are the main advantages of it? One is magnification, which we already elaborated that bigger the telescope, your angle is reduced. Okay, so that comes the focal length of object by eyepiece. And the other bigger advantage of a telescope is light gathering. The bigger the primary mirror or primary lens, you are collecting more and more light. So one by R square law plays here. And this is the light gathering power is proportional to the area. So a very quick example of four inch telescope and human eye with eight mm, you are gaining the light gathering power is on 56 times. So you can actually observe by the four inch telescope compared to human eye, 156 times fainter. And you can quickly make out how many magnitudes fainter you can observe with a 100 mm telescope. Uh, this is another thing, the last one before I move to actual photometry definition. Um, this comes about, this slide is more relevant uh, for people who used to use photography using the standard cameras for say the full moon or during eclipse, the sun. Interestingly, both sun and moon happen to subtend an angle of half a degree. Edge to edge is about half a degree. Uh, this is just coincident. It may not happen on Mars or other planets. 
Now, of course, Mars will have its own. So this is again the plate scale, which means on the image of the photograph, in today's language is the CCD frame. So even if you use a cell phone, it has a CCD detector, though it is very small, few millimeter. You have to accommodate the full disk of sun or moon on your uh, camera in the mobile phone. So this is the formula coming, degree, I told 57 radians. And in arc second, it is this number, six digit number. So this is the scale that means every millimeter on your picture, on your CCD, in your camera or on the photographic film, it is corresponding to that angle in the sky. Which means if you have a galaxy image, if the galaxy is this much, it comes to a very small thing on your detector. So this is the formula for that. The focal length of the lens used comes in the picture. So all your mobile phones have a lens in the camera. Um, and then this, I have taken an example of an eight inch telescope and that translates eight inch into 11 into this. So the F, the focal length of this telescope, because these are F11. What is some of you who still have older cameras, not very old, on the lens, it is written F by three, F by four. That is essentially the focal length to the diameter of the lens. This is that number. In this case, it is F11 means the focal length is 88 inches. Convert that to millimeter. It is about 2000 millimeter focal. And you put all these numbers correctly, the image size of a sun or moon will be about 18 millimeter. So, of course, you can do this exercise for your mobile camera. If you know the, you can go to the specs of your mobile camera and that will give you the what is the lens diameter and focal length, etc. And you can find out this. Now, telescopes can be used in two different ways. One is taking an image, you take a CCD camera, or you collect all the light into a point and uh, call it photometry, which means you are only interested in the total light and its variations. Why variations? Because stars, 60% of the stars you see in the night are having variable light due to various reasons. Again, we will go to that at some point. So imaging is important because you have to have edge to edge, the galaxy has to be image, it should be very sharp. So the optics has to be very great all the way up to the edges. Whereas here, it's not so important. Only care you have to take care is that it is focused well. If it is unfocused, of course, you will lose the uh, bright signal, but you have to focus it well. It doesn't care whether the shape of the star is sharp or not, because anyway, as I said, the star is continuously fluctuating. So after focusing, even if it is fluctuates, it should come within the detector area. And that's where the photometry is important. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is, I will deviate a bit into very basic black body radiation, which all of you, I'm sure even in school, high school, it is being taught. Uh, but in BSc, of course, it is taught. So black body is an ideal object. Why I'm talking about black body, it will very easily become clear because it has direct astrophysical consequences. All the way up to cosmology, which many lectures will cover in this school. So you will realize, that's why we wanted to give this lecture on the first day itself, so that you will appreciate why the thing like basic black body has direct consequence on uh, astrophysics. So black body is an idealized object, absorbs all the electromagnetic radiation falling and also emits in 100%. So there is no ideal such black body. Of course, you have equivalents which are called primary and secondary and so on. So it's a temperature dependent spectrum. And there are three parts of black body. The main is the Planck's law. VN's displacement law and Stefan's law. I'm just revising in astrophysical context. So this is a typical black body spectrum at different temperatures, 3000 at a cooler body and 6000, which is similar to sun. And you can see I've shown in colors, this is the visible part which you are seeing. This axis is wavelength in nano, in micrometers. So two micrometer means basically uh, uh, one micrometer uh, is 10 nanometer. So you can just convert them. Nanometer is 10 to the power minus nine meter. Okay, so thousand angstroms is basically 100 nanometer. So these conversions have to be borne in mind. And this side is the intensity. So ultraviolet, infrared, and visible is what human eyes see. Of course, there are detectors in 
all these range including radio will come to that and you can see the three things are happening when the body becomes hotter and hotter the peak you see the peak is slowly shifting towards blue this side is blue because the body is becoming hotter the area under the curve which is essentially the total energy of the black body is also increasing and of course uh, the shape is also changing so uh, essentially this is what is the basic concept of black body this is again a similar picture now in context of stars a blue star which is 18000 degree kelvin will have a light which is peaking at 4000 for 400 nanometer which is in blue similarly a very hot star but uh, but red which has only 4000 degree kelvin like little juice will look reddish because the peak is in the red region that's why the colors are also chosen in this plot okay now these are again the some formulas i will not spend too much detail this is in uh, in what called the mks system and you will notice that this is in lambda and this is in frequency and because of this frequency c by lambda uh, if you differentiate that's why lambda square comes and that's why this lambda 5 comes whereas it is nu q is more easier to understand in in the wavelength and so these are the basic concepts speed of light uh, which is basically uh, this comes out to be almost 300 kilometers per second there are three conditions one is vn's displacement law as a direct consequence we will come to that h nu much much less than kt or hc much much larger than lambda then you have these two formulas and similarly rayle's rayle jeans law is the other way okay hc much much less than lambda kt and finally the total energy you integrate from minus infinity to infinity and it the total energy integrated is watts per meter square which is stefan boltzmann's constant sigma and t to the power 4 So, for example, for sun, it is fifty-seven hundred degree Kelvin. You put T here and put the correct units. Then, sun from its surface, surface of the star, in this case, the sun, is throwing out six kilowatt of energy per centimeter square. And only a part of that really reaches us because we are not seeing the. We are only seeing a part of the sun through a telescope or whatever, and that's why you have to put those angles in, in the correct formulation. uh let's see what this shows yeah so now uh, because of this vn's displacement law let's skip all that because this is a simple constant which you have to remember lambda maximum into t is 3 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter kelvin you put these numbers for sun which has a which is yellowish so 0.5 micron means 5000 angstroms or 500 nanometer you get the temperature of its black body corresponding as 6000 degree kelvin Okay, which is actually fifty-seven hundred degree Kelvin sun. Earth, the average temperature of Earth is about twenty-seven degree Kelvin uh, centigrade, so it comes to about two seventy-three per twenty-seven, three hundred degree Kelvin, and you get ten micro, which means Earth is actually radiating in the infrared at ten micro, which also means any satellite which is launched, and if it is an infrared satellite observing in this band, if Earth comes in the field. it will saturate the detector so they try to avoid in these bands so that the earth doesn't if it comes in the field they switch off the detector and electronics and last which again i am not going to talk but most of the talk in this school will be on cosmic uh, background and cosmology and you can just extend this to 1000 micro 1000 micro means 1 mm 1 mm means the temperature corresponding to 3 degree kelvin so the whole of universe whenever it was formed Several billion years back, today is at a temperature of this, and there are micro fluctuations in different angles, which the cosmology lectures will cover. But basically, you can see the significance of black body. It's all coming from that, and all these detectors are millimeter wave detectors, and that's why millimeter wave astronomy becomes very important in the last decade. There have been many satellite launches, COBE and WMAP, and so on, which you will hear. um i will somewhat skip this little more technical what is bolometric so i only mentioned that uh, infinity to minus infinity right the integration but actually there is nothing like that in fact no real detector on earth can measure everything from minus to plus infinity. what it will detect is it limited 
lambda 1 to lambda 2, let us say. But compare it with an ideal, which is minus infinity to infinity, then you have the similar concept of apparent and absolute bolometric method. The bolometric, the word comes from a detector which can observe many wavelengths, not ideally minus infinity to infinity, but that's how the word bolometric flux, etc., comes. And very similar, since it's a magnitude scale, you will have the luminosity of the star, the D, all those things. So these two slides cover all that. I will not uh, go into finer details, but essentially bolometric correction is the correction which I was hinting at. Assuming that no detector is ideal, what is the correction? Small m means apparent, capital means absolute. Now, another important thing is color index. Now, you have seen in a dark room, if you leave your iron or the press on, it looks reddish because it attains some temperature, which is not, of course, as hot as a star. It looks, so low temperature things look reddish, whereas increasing the temperature make them bluish. And what is this difference called? Is the B and V. So blue magnitude and visible. I'm still not to define what is B and V. We will soon define it. So the difference between these two magnitudes is called the color index. That means if B minus V is negative, remember this is magnitude scale. Negative means it is brighter and also it's a hot star. And positive means cool star. So if you just use an approximate formula like this, again, this has approximations. You can measure B minus V for any star, uh, which means you measure it in blue and visible filters, the light coming from the star, which is a black body. And use this formula, you can get the temperature of the star, T effect. Now, effective temperature can be found from what is called as Stephen Boltzmann law, if one can observe the complete radiation at all wavelengths in absolute interest. So coming back to the same argument as uh, what I said, bolometry. So spectral sequences, the stars are called hot or cold and their colors have a direct uh, relation to the temperature of the star. So this is just a slide here uh, with spectroscopies. You know, use this just uh, as a joke, but you can try to remember at least from O to M, wow, be a fine girl, kiss me right now. So. The hottest stars are W and O. We will see in the next slide the temperatures. And the cool stars are here. Sun is G. So this is a table which shows the hot stars more than 50,000. They look very bluish. They're called Wolfram stars. And B type stars, the A. So just don't uh, ask why this sequence was used. Today's people could have used with the digital world. Uh, simply asked A, B, C, D, but astronomy being an old subject, nobody likes to change the concepts. So what is happening here? Sun is somewhere here, G, 6,000 degree. And very hot stars are so hot that uh, all the gases have evaporated. Only very light gases like hydrogen and helium remain. But as the stars are cooler and cooler, they keep retain many of the heavier elements. And you will see the orange red star like Betelgeuse has heavy element like titanium dioxide and so on. Okay, so this is just the color versus temperature. These two columns are important and what are the uh, constituents in the atmosphere. Um, this is another important thing. I will not go into detail of this called hertzsprung russell diagram. Uh, these two persons found that if they observe many, many stars, they can put them on a plot and at this axis, there is a uh, there is temperature and this acts as the absolute luminosity. Uh, the next picture will make it more clear, but I still, before I move, most of the stars lie in this band. It's called the main sequence. And many stars have evolved. They move into different directions like supergiants or they become very small stars. So this is another image of the same thing. This is the main sequence. The Sirius is sitting here. Sun is here. Sun, if I take as a, for one mag uh, absolute magnitude, then stars can be much brighter or much fainter. And fainter stars will be on this side. Okay. There's another picture again showing the colors also. The sun is somewhere here, it's a yellow green color. And the stars can evolve on the blue side or they can become dwarf stars. Uh, I will not 
go into too much detail, but this formula you will recognize from my magnitude definition. This only tells that Vega, which is a zero magnitude star, okay, uh, nicely easy to remember, thousand photons per centimeter square per angstrom. That is the spectroscopy bend per second is from the surface of the star. Now that is from Vega. So that light has to come all the way to Earth through your telescope. So actual number of photons which you will receive, maybe only a few tens. And imagine there are much, much fainter stars which can be measured. So this is just to remember the formula and easy to remember. Zero when you star has thousand photons coming out of its surface per square centimeter per angstrom per second. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I will slowly move on to a little bit of imaging. So as I said, photography film was there for till almost early 1900, but then CCDs came somewhere in 90s. And these are detectors which are very efficient and it gave a very big boost to just physical experiments in physics and other subjects, but mostly in astronomy. And they require, of course, cooling because the thermionic noise uh, reduces. And there are many advantages of CC because the photographic films had to be actually scanned with the scanner and all that. CCD is a digital device. Each position you have the count. So you have X and Y and the Z axis is the intensity, right? So suppose the saturation is, let's say 250 pound, uh, counts and the dark level is five counts Then anything in between five to 250, you are getting the signal. So you have X, Y, and Z is the intensity. So three parameters in the CCD. This is a nice picture taken by a photographic film, Fuji Chrome, with a eight inch telescope. And you can see the beautiful image of galaxy. But when you use CCD, firstly, of course, the colors are synthetic even in photographic film, even though you may think color film or in color images on your mobile film camera, the detectors are actually having only three colors, blue, green, and they merge them digitally to get these artificial colors. So real colors can be seen by human eye, provided it's a bright object. So for example, if you see the Orion nebula, it looks very green or, but that is a color you are seeing because that's an object which is bright. If it is a very faint object, you can't distinguish the human eye, can't distinguish the colors. Same is true for digital imaging. So, only way is you synthetically add some pixels to some colors and assign the colors. So, as I said, the digital images can be manipulated since it's on the computer, you can adjust the contrast and so on. Very much like what Photoshop does, uh, used to do in 10 years back and even today you can do Photoshop of your digital images. So I'll skip some of these things. Let me just quickly come to what's actually, so I told you imaging is CCD and photometer collects all the light and one point. So this is where you couple to the telescope eyepiece. And this is a diaphragm or an aperture through which you will restrict only the star plus a little bit of sky. Otherwise all the other lights will come in. And at the moment, just don't go into this. This lens helps to uh, kind of integrate the fluctuation of the star, which I was saying. And finally, there is a filter. Why filter? The colors will come in the picture and the detector. So this is a basic photometer. This is a picture of a photometer, which last 20, 30 years, all the students doing MSc Astro, at least with IUCAS and other universities have this and a telescope. So the light comes here. There is a mirror which flips it. This is, you can barely see the B and V colors, filters, and you see the counts on the display, right? So if you use a B filter, the blue filter for Sirius, which is a blue star, you will get more counts. And if you use the V filter, then you will get less because Sirius is a blue. So the, the, the visible side of the black body has less intensity. Uh, this is the prime reason, even though this slide looks very simple, why most of the money in astronomy is going. Just to elaborate a few minutes on this, what is this? This is a standard star with slight fluctuation, right? A star which doesn't change. Whereas here, in front of the star, another star is occulting it, okay? Which means just like eclipse, for some time the star light is obstructed and again recovers. 
Now, this could be a large planet like Jupiter. So somebody from outside our galaxy looks at solar system. The Jupiter will occult the sun at some point during its orbit and for a short time, but this variation can be seen. So depending on this sharpness of this fall, this has to be measured very like in this several dots, just to measure sometimes in milliseconds. So the accuracy has to be there. And from this slope, you can do some calculations and tell how big the object is. And actually, if you do in different colors, this measurement, you can even talk of the, uh, the light of the planet, what color it is, and so on. So this becomes an exoplanet transit. So this word exoplanet becomes any planet which is uh, moving around its star in the course of other galaxies and other stars. So thousands and thousands of such exoplanets exist as we know now and many satellites have been launched just basically to do this. And of course, if it is very faint, obviously from Earth you can't do, so limitations will come. So even then this change itself may be so small that you need very sensitive or very large light collecting telescopes. So people are interested in planets around stars and life in those planets and so on. So that's a different topic altogether, but it is driving the astronomy budget in all the so all the blast telescopes have one of the main scientific programs of transit uh, just a little bit about ccd i will skip some of this text part and this is the typical standard photometric filters so what i'm going to do is just so you can see the colors this is where around the yellow green region right where our human eye peak is there and what are these uh, curves? These are the bandwidths of color glass or filters as they are called. So this is the V band because this is where the human eye, the red, infrared, and B, the blue. Okay. And what in this white line is a typical B type star. I have defined what is B type star. It's a hot star. And if you try to draw a smooth curve on this, it is peaking in the blue region, which means it is a hot star B type. And what are these? Dips here, these are in the atmosphere of such a star, uh, these wavelengths where the light is absorbed. And uh, this is specific to that particular star. So if it is a hydrogen, then hydrogen bands will be seen. So there is a H alpha line somewhere here, and so H beta and so on. So this is an overall picture of the BVR, or if you go extended to R, photometry bands. And remember, these are if you convert these curves into a rectangle. It is roughly 1,000 angstroms. So these color filters are about 1,000 angstroms white. Uh, this is a picture which you, sh which you saw a little while ago, but now I have handwritten some things on that. So what are those? I have put the B, which is 4,000 to 5,000 angstroms. Okay, and the peak is at 4,500 angstroms. Similarly, V, 5,500 and red, 6,500. These are approximate. And you can see the different temperatures here. And, and in the shade, I have put the visible band and other things. So why, what are those uh, error bars which I have shown, at least for B, V, and R? Okay, <clears throat> now the x-axis error bar comes from obvious reason that these are about 1,000 stops, right? So what is happening is in this black body curve for any particular star, you are collecting the light between 1,000 stops and averaging it out, right? You're not going any finer. So which means already there is an error bar sitting of 1,000 microns for all the three or for that matter, any other band. What is the y-axis error? That is the intensity. This is coming from the photons. Now, in basic physics, we must have learned, otherwise I can tell you that any light coming from star or your bulb in your room is coming in bunches of photons and they are continuously fluctuating. And how is the fluctuation if you measure them every second, measure the intensity, say 100, 101, 140, 99. If you keep noting these numbers, it will turn out to be a nice Poisonian distribution. In fact, this experiment we did long back during our PhD days, we closed a small LED. Those days LEDs had already come. It's a very light, low light level LED and closed it in an instrument, which is a closed cylinder and a detector, which was a photometric tube and kept on taking these counts, 
uh, for about 3,000 such counts and just use that data and plot a histogram, the envelope of the histogram, the top parts of the histogram will follow a Poisson distribution. So that's how the fluctuation of a star. So suppose a star light has 100 counts. It is continuously fluctuation by square root of 100. It is coming because of the Poisson distribution. And that also is a big advantage because the same Poisson effect, that is the square root of 100 is the fluctuation plus minus 10, gives you an advantage to measure the sensitivity of the instrument. I will not go into details. At some point, it will be covered in the slides. So this picture essentially shows you what are the bands, what is the black body, which is part of the star, which you are seeing. And of course, the starlight is not so smooth unless it's a very hot star, which has very little absorption features. And later stars, that is the cooler stars, will have many, many absorption features. We will see the real spectra of these stars in tomorrow's lecture. Now, let's see what is the next thing. So maybe I will just continue a little more. And slowly, as you will notice, I'm entering into the spectroscope. So what is this? This is a beautiful, nice picture, which actually Newton, if you see some of the basic optics book, used a prism in his hand. He was sitting in a room and sunlight was coming through a small hole in the room. The rest of it was dark. And on the opposite wall, he saw this nice, beautiful spectrum. So this is essentially the light split into different layers. And it's continuous, right? Any white light will have this kind of thing, unless it is a uh, something which is like a star which has an atmosphere around it. We will quickly see that. But essentially, this side is, uh, on further you go, this side is ultraviolet, this is red. So all the colors, and this is where the human eye's maximum sensitivity is. This is an emission spectrum. So if the shell of the star, or if you have a bulb, and outside you have an atmosphere, and you heat it, then it will emit in this. So these are mercury lines, for example. So you all have tube lights, not the LED ones. The older tube lights uh, have uh, mercury in them. And this is the famous 5461 green line of mercury. It's faint, but the other lines are there. There is interestingly, just like sodium has doublet, all of you have done BSC level experiments with uh, D1, D2 of uh, sodium, 5890, Similarly, mercury actually, many people are not aware, has also a doublet, but it's not 6, 7, 7, it's 20. 5770 and 5790 are the two wavelengths of yellow doublets of, um, of uh, mercury. And this is the same picture as if now you have an atmosphere. So the continuous was the white light, and these are the absorptions at the same wavelengths of uh, mercury in this case. So this is what is happening. It's a very crude but very explanatory picture. This is a bulb or a star uh, which doesn't have atmosphere, let us say. So it will give a continuous spectrum like this. But suppose there is a gas around it, which is hot, which will emit, which will have emission spectra. And if it is cool, then it will have absorptions. Of course, sometimes both can happen in some stars.
Uh, hello. Uh, sorry for the break. Uh, there was some problem in my Wi-Fi. I have kind of restored it. So let's see. Uh, I'll go back to the chat box. And... Uh, um, I think the chat box is also stopped showing the messages for some reason. Okay, we'll do a very simple thing. Anyone who wants to ask question, let me see if it is. Uh, no, all the older messages have were deleted. So best is uh, people can just raise their hands in the reaction window. And if I see a raised hand, I will uh, basically answer that question. So yeah, Shritis uh, Srivastava, you can unmute and ask. Hello. Uh, yes, ask your question. Yeah, sir. sir I want to ask that, uh, is there any limitation to CCDs and uh, what else can be used for digital imaging? Okay, limitation of CCD, it's a good question. Usually, I mean, unless you shine a laser to the CCD, it will burn, but CCDs really don't have, they can only get saturated with bright star, but nothing beyond that. So uh, what the electronics of the CCD decides that if it exceeds certain level defined by the detector, it switches off the electronics. So really speaking, there is no limit to the bright star or bright image, but uh, essentially, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a device which is digital, so it doesn't affect anything. The next question, since we don't have much time and many hands are there, Akshat, unmute and ask. Oh, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Sir, I wanted to ask, why is B minus V negative for hot stars? Is it because of the magnitude? Yes, it is the magnitude definition. So hot star will have more blue light. Uh, than visible light, which means B minus V will be a negative quantity. And negative quantity in the magnitude scale I defined is for bluer stars or hotter stars. Okay, next is Pushti. You can yes, unmute and ask. Unmute sir, uh, and ask. Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, you told about the color index method. So we can find the temperature of any other object instead of... Um, Stars. Yeah, it's a good question. In principle, yes, but the sensitivity will go down. No? The difference has to be much larger. You see, and that's an approximate formula, as I already said. But just to answer you more technically, if you take the spectra of any object, not star, even then you can measure the temperature. You have to fit it to a black body. So that is the standard way of doing it. Uh, I missed out Gaurav. So Gaurav Bhattacharya, you can ask, unmute. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Sir, actually, I want to uh, ask you, like, can you please repeat the uh, example which you did, gave, like, uh, while uh, it's blowing the balloon, like, uh, okay. relating to the so, apparent and the absolute. Yeah. So, when you talk of absolute magnitude, it has to be defined. So, 10 parsec is a distance from, let's say, Earth or solar system, it doesn't matter, is a distance all around you as a shell. Okay, assume that a shell like a surface of a balloon. So for that hypothetical moment, in the night, say all the stars come to that point. So sun is actually close to us. It has to go back to reach 10 parsecs, so it will become fainter. Similarly, any star which is very far, if it has to come closer, it will become brighter. So simple concept. Okay. Okay, next, uh, Sudeksha. Unmute and ask. Sudeksha, you unmute and ask. Sure, Apara, whatever name it is showing here. Not uh, able to. Yes, sir. Hello, hello. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tell me. Th yes, sir. Question. Sir, actually, you showed the emission spectra. Uh, the uh, background was black. Means, I mean, uh, I want to. So just know that if the star is in background, then it will be clear. Give the continuous spectra. Uh, so in yes, that yes, case, yes. Yeah. yeah, I understand your question. So essentially, yes. that black is only in the in the slide, but still some uh, light level is there. So very good example is uh, a mercury lamp. A mercury tube light has a background which is already there, like a continuum star, 
and over and above that you have the green and other lines whereas uh, sodium lamp uh, you, you all use sodium in your bsc level has only d1 d2 two lines rest is all dark okay so sodium is good for astronomy because it doesn't contaminate the earth's atmosphere whereas the continuous part of the mercury lamp uh, continuously uh, scatters in the atmosphere that's why all the observatories and nearby cities have the policy to use sodium lamp in the cities and also sodium lamp is more uh, what you call uh, energy efficient so that's the answer to your question but yes the dark is relative uh, next question is bhavesh unmute and ask uh, yeah hello sir good afternoon so um, this may seem like a trivial question but when we look at the spectrum for the uh, not the spectrum but the graph for the black body plot we notice that there is obviously a maxima and towards the right hand side of the maxima on the x axis there is a gradual decrease in the intensity but on the left hand side of the maxima there is a very sharp decrease of the intensity so okay so what you are saying is this is not exactly like a gaussian curve it is asymmetric correct yeah so the reason is you can everybody knows programming so you can just use that formula put in some numbers and see it will automatically come because of the 1 by lambda 5 factor in the exponent so okay. so that's why it is coming it's a mathematical property of that formula okay but like is there any specific physical reason to that or is it's just uh, uh, physical reason not really because that's how the the way the radiation is it is sharp decrease on the, this side on the red side it is slow decrease if you plot it in terms of frequency it will just flip so it's basically the effect of the uh, of that uh, relation the black body ah, okay thank next thank you lot sir next question is somebody called dwij brambat so unmute and ask good afternoon sir uh, i wanted to ask that uh you showed a formula which was varying of the it was varying uh, with diameter the formula for the magnitude yes. it was varying with diameter so does that mean that uh, uh and higher diameter lenses help to identify fainter objects and what is the reason for that okay simple answer is 1 by r square law everybody knows in optics is bigger the the diameter or the area you are collecting more photons as simple as that so so it is uh, that's why the d is coming in that formula and of course it is right now uh, what you call uh, the crude formula but you have to go more specific for uh, for any other uh, uh, i mean you have to include other effects also i think we'll move to the next question from deep data unmute yes sir sir so my question is uh, am i audible uh, there is some interference so i will let me finish with deep and then come back to whoever is asking so deep yeah continue yes sir so i was asking we you talked about the absolute and the apparent magnitude of the individual stars now sir what will happen if i consider a binary system if a binary star system how am i supposed to no they are absolute okay. it doesn't matter you, you it is binary or three stars the light coming out is basically a intensity which you are measuring or seeing so it doesn't matter whether it is binary or three. that doesn't matter that doesn't matter even if it is a galaxy ultimately it is the light which your human eye is seeing or the detector is seeing so it doesn't matter is the same 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 procedure okay uh, next hand is shrikant uh, sir i wanted to ask that Uh, huh. In the case uh, that we had that reflecting telescope, uh, what should be the ideal uh, shape of the mirror that we use? Can we go with a parabolic shape? Or... Okay, that's a little more technical. Uh, basically, it has to be parabolic because the optical, uh, what you call the aberrations, are minimum for parabolic. Uh, there are some places where they use non-parabolic, but the secondary and primary combination ultimately has to reduce what is called the optical aberration. So. mostly if the secondary is a flat mirror then the primary is parabolic next is uh, okay. patil dr patil unmute and ask sir good afternoon sir am i audible sir yeah so what is the physical application of m2 minus m1 is equal to 2.5 log of to the west 10 f2 upon f1 
So what is the physical? So physical thing is suppose of course this is all relative science astronomy. So if somebody has a table of two values, small m and capital L, that is absolute and apparent. Then by subtracting, you directly get the distance to the stars. Uh, this is only the photometric or the what you call the parallax way. There are other methods in spectroscopy where stars spectrum is related to the distance, which is called spectroscopic parallax. And I am not uh, covering that in the talk. Uh, next is Divakar Ratto. Uh, sir, my question is whether yeah. there is any relation between the absolute and the uh, relative magnitude with the luminosity of the star. Yes, yes. You some of the slides I passed through. It's all mentioned in that uh, how it is related to the absolute to this to the distance to the star and even the diameter of the star. I'll just go through those slides where I have defined uh, absolute and uh, bolometric magnitude, etc. There is a question from Ajay Kumar. Sir, hello, sir. Am I audible? Ah. Sir, I want to ask that the absolute and uh, this uh, apparent magnitude is the absolute magnitude of fixed constant quantity and the apparent magnitude changes with altitude. Am I right? Sir? Uh, say it again once more. Repeat the question. Sir, the, uh, sir, am I right, sir? The absolute magnitude due magnitude is a fixed quantity and the apparent magnitude changes with the altitude and the atmosphere. No, no, no. So, firstly, apparent magnitude is apparent by definition. Of course, the atmospheric effect both the things, but remove the effects of atmosphere, then these two numbers are, for example, a serious. It is known that this is the magnitude, which is minus one point four. An absolute from the table you can see. So those numbers won't change because they have been measured with the uh, keeping uh, Vega, which is a standard star in mind. So as soon as you say standard star Vega, the distance is automatically hidden in that because of the ten pass. Okay, I think uh, I will not take any more question. I will quickly go into uh, uh, the chat box. Uh, not cover all of them. Um, Absorption photon wave and telescope, and how they can be reduced. Absorption of photon on the telescope, there is somebody, Shritiz is asking. Yes, the absorption of the photons on the telescope glass and scattering takes place. That's why all those relations are approximate. Um, you take exoplanets which are present, multi star system, by using transit method. Um, somebody called Lushikes is asking if there are uh, exoplanets which are part of a multi-star system, uh, transit method can be used. Uh, yes and no, because if it is a multi-star and if the stars are too close, then you can't distinguish. Although there could be a, uh, another star could be rotating around it, or if the bigger star or the heavier star has a planet, it will show in, as a dip, but it can't distinguish unless they are separated out. Uh, determine the wobbles of star motion that I don't know. Eyepiece used here is Hagen's eyepiece. Uh, somebody is asking Avishek uh, which eyepiece it is. This is a technical question, but yes, different eyepieces are there, like hygiene size piece, to improve the quality of this. These are all mostly for visual things. People use these for initial focusing, and after that, ultimately, the detector like CCD um, uh, uh, takes care. Somebody is asking a statistical question, Mahinder. Uh, how do we calculate 90% significant level? So you have to measure the sigma. And from that scatter plot only, you will know whether your measurement is lying in the 90% or percent or 99%. I think uh, there are some question on the uh, link of the, of the, which is provided by the organizer, uh, which is the uh, spreadsheet link. Those answers I will do later in the day because they can be offline. One last question by somebody called Isra El Tahir. Can you just unmute and ask the question and then I will want to. Isra, can you unmute? No response. Okay, I will just close it. So all whatever pending questions, you can put it on the spreadsheet. And I will try to answer them uh, before tomorrow's lecture. So <clears throat> I must thank all of you for the nice questions. And tomorrow we meet at 11.30, uh, the same Zoom link. And uh, 
Meanwhile, you can add more questions on the spreadsheet. Thank you.